The burden that is on my heart this evening is uh, that uh, of uh, a message on a somewhat neglected aspect of Christian experience, uh, the aspect of unrest, of unrest. Thank God we are brought into a place of rest, in Christian experience, rest from bondage, rest from fear, so that we can with full heart sing, love brings the glorious fullness in, and to his saints makes known the blessed rest from inbred sin through faith in Christ alone. But I fear that in our endeavor to safeguard that truth, we have lost sight of the other. That uh, there is in Christian experience an element of unrest. You have it in the words of Jesus, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day, the night cometh. And then you have it in his words, also with reference to the cities. I must uh, preach the gospel in other cities, the element of unrest. And then in another portion, I must be about my father's business. There you have this element of unrest of the very soul of Jesus. Now in this portion that I'm going to read to you, it's just a very short portion, we have this truth brought before us. And so uh, come with me to 1 Corinthians and uh, chapter 9. And we might read from verse 25 to the end. 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 25. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Thus, 25, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I don't think anyone can read this passage of Scripture prayerfully and not to be impressed by the thought that the Christian life has at its very center the element of action. So fight I. Some time ago, I listened to the testimony of a young man who was brought to Christ during a special crusade we had in London. It was the crusade conducted by Dr. Billy Graham. This young man made a profession of faith in Christ. And uh, I believe that 
with many others, he had an experience. But I was somewhat disturbed and surprised by his testimony. Here it is. I have now discovered that the Christian experience can better be described not as a battle, that is, not as a fight, but uh, as a song, mingled with the sound of happy laughter in some glade in lovely England. Now, I didn't agree with him. It uh, is obvious that uh, what he had in his mind, what is uh, commonly referred to today as happy laughter in Christian experience. Well, I'm not saying that there isn't happy laughter in Christian experience, of course, there is, who ought to be happy but a Christian. But uh, when you hear people say, as this young man, I'm sure, would have said, come to Jesus and be happy. Well, I, I'm not with them there. If uh, the motive is just happiness, to my mind, it's wrong. It's wrong. The motive ought ever to be the glory of God in Jesus Christ. And I fear that uh, in the average mentality of the average Christian, that is the general conception of today. I've said repeatedly because I believe it, that the devil's master strategy is to destroy the power within the Christian to wage war against sin. I must fight. I must fight. So Fight I, said the Apostle. Indeed, I would go as far as to say that the only faith that really matters is the faith in action. Because after all, is it not stated in Hebrews that faith without works is dead? Perhaps I could say at the risk of being misunderstood, Satan today has got, what I say, the average evangelist to play down the cost of discipleship. So in his desire to make converts, he uses the technique of... Uh, the modern salesman who shows the best side of the article. But that is not what I learn in New Testament. And after all, we have got to keep to the New Testament. That is our standard and that is where we are taught in the things of God, the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament reveals him as a realist. He knows that he will never be popular. Oh, he knows that. And he knows his followers need never expect to be. He would have men follow him, knowing the cost. This is what it costs. It means a fight. 
It means to wage war. It means to unfurl my banner, the banner of the cross, and defy hell and Satan as we take our stand for the things that really matter. He would have us do that, or he would let us go our own way. As in the case, you remember, of the rich young ruler. Oh, he came to Jesus. He appeared to be sincere, honest, and desirous of knowing truth. But when Jesus presented him with the cross, we read that he went away sorrowful. If I apprehend the teaching of Jesus rightly, he calls us not to a life of ease, but to one of endeavor, endeavor, and he's saying to you and to me tonight, put on the whole armor of God, put on not part of it, but the whole armor. I love that portion in the Old Testament that speaks of God having given us a banner. He has given a banner to them that fear him, that it may be displayed because of the truth. So we are called upon, you are and I am, to take our place beneath this glorious banner a banner to them that fear him. That's why we, at least in Scotland, sing, So with banner unfurled to the breeze, our motto shall holiness be, till the crown from his hand we receive, and the king in his glory we see. You see, not to Paul, the gospel was a promise of life, but that promise of life was also a proclamation to battle. I am sure that is the thought in the mind of the writer, must I be carried to the skies on flowery beds of ease while others fought to win the prize and sail through bloody seas. He knew that the peace of God meant, oh, he knew that. He also realized that the same peace meant battle. It coincided with war against sin. I heard a minister See, recently, it was in Edinburgh, Scotland, a Christianity that can wink at the evils of our day, whose only contribution is pious platitudes, has ceased to function as a power for God. I believe that in that statement, that minister was expressing truth. Oh, we need this element of unrest. I, I must be up. I must be doing. I must accomplish something worthwhile for him who shed his precious blood, rich blessings to bestow. And I plunge beneath that crimson stream that washes white as snow. Now, in this portion that I've just mentioned, there are two things suggested in the passage. First of all, you have the certainty, the certainty in experience. I, therefore, so run not as uncertainly, so fight I. 
suggesting, of course, that if our faith is to have a firm foundation, we must be convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that the God that we worship is a living God. Not like the man that spoke to me that I mentioned already in, in England, in one of our universities there. He said this, I believe in God, but I do not know him. That was not David's conception. My soul thirsteth, he cried, for God. But he added this, that God is a living God. My soul thirsteth for God, the living God. Does you go forth shortly to preach the gospel? Oh, see to it that beyond the shadow of a doubt, your God is a living God. I felt that that truth came home very forcibly to us this morning. I don't know how you felt, but I felt that God was here. You know, dear people, that I have seldom, and now I say this from the depth of my heart, I've seldom been so near to revival as we were here this morning. Seldom, I tell you. And I would even go as far as to say we were in revival. Sometimes we have a, a strong and a wrong conception on what revival really is. Oh, that thou wouldest revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in thee. Did that take place this morning? I ask again, did it take place this morning? Were we not rejoicing in God? Were there not those in our midst who were thanking God for having come? Oh, brother, sister, don't dishonor God by inferring that he didn't answer our prayers. Revival is a moving in the midst of God's people. Then here you have Paul using another metaphor. It is that uh, of a runner, that of a runner who is not certain of winning. He's in the race. Oh, he's in the race. And were he with us this evening and... Uh, Contemplating going out uh, to Israel, he would be questioning in his heart if he would make it, if he would just reach the winning post. But Paul tells me, no, that is not me at all. I run to obtain. That's my motive. That's my aim. That's my object. And I cannot think of anything less than that. That's the spirit, brother. Oh, that's the spirit. I was sitting by the fireside one night. It was during the revival. Sitting beside... The minister, we were at it all day, meetings here and meetings there, anxious souls seeking the Savior in different places. And now we're, we're sitting by the fire, what I say as we sometimes say, toasting our toes. It's about midnight when we heard a tap at the window and the minister went to the door and to hear a girl saying this, how 
can you ministers sit beside the fire toasting your toes with scores of men and women in a neighboring village seeking the Savior just now? That was Mary Morrison that I so often referred to. That was her. Not as uncertainty, so fight I. And she would not have the ministers doing anything else but to go out on a fearful night. Oh, the rain was pelting. She got a hold of a lorry somewhere and came straight to the man. Not as uncertainly, but confidence in the realization that the God who was moving in this village was the God who could save to the uttermost. That's the spirit. Oh, I tell you, that is the spirit. Yes, there was a man there who did not have confidence in his ability. Paul says, I am not like that man. I run that I may obtain. In other words, he is saying, I run to purpose. And I'm not going to drift. Oh, there are so many today in Christian work and witness who are just drifting. Going with the others, yes. Praying with the others, yes. Talking much with the others, yes, but drifting. With no sense of purpose. No sense of conviction that the God who has called is the God who revives and the God who is anxious to send revival. The certainty in experience. And oh, I pray that not one young man or woman will leave this fellowship without being absolutely certain that God has called you. Oh, if not, my advice to you would be get home as quick as you can. There's no time. There's no place for a person that is not certain of his call and God's purpose for him. Oh, I say that without any fear of contradiction. So real to myself. I've known it down through the years. To be absolutely certain is vital. Vital. Then uh, you have definiteness, definite, definiteness in action. I love that word of the apostles. I run to obtain. Now I wonder, how could Paul be so thus assured. How could he be absolutely certain that in his running he was going to obtain? What in effect is Paul saying? Well, it seems to me that this is very much in his mind. If I run, if I run with eternity's values in view, I can count upon God. He has promised, and his word is the word of a gentleman, as said David Livingstone. And that's it. And there it ends. This portion gives us a clue to Paul's reason for his diligence. Did you notice that word? Lest that by any means, 
When I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. What has he in his mind? He set out with eternity's values in his view. I'm called to be, what I see again, the ambassador of eternity in the courts of time. I'm called to that. And I dare not fail God in it. That's the mind. Oh, that's the mind. We must not, of course, suppose that Paul has any doubt as to his salvation. Scripture cannot contradict Scripture. Listen to his great affirmation. I know in whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I committed unto him against that day. He is not thinking of his salvation. He has not the thought of being cast away from his salvation in his mind. Oh, I can hear someone say, he's a Calvinist, all right. Is that what you're saying? Well, thank God for Calvinists that believe that. I believe he is thinking of failure in service. Oh, he's afraid that he'll fail God. When I say that he's afraid that souls may drift to hell because of his failure, and because he slipped up somewhere, and I would say, young people, there's room for reflection here. Today, there is a terrible drift away from the stand Paul took. Indeed, I would go as far as to say the church is fluttered by castaways. Oh, may God deliver us. May God deliver us. When was it silver shall men call them? Because the Lord hath rejected them. Oh, how dreadful it is to think that I, sitting here in this meeting tonight, facing this profound truth and thinking of the nearness of God this morning. Oh, how dreadful to think that God would cast me away. The Lord hath rejected them. I pray that that may not happen. Now in this connection, a verse from Jeremiah chapter 5, I think verse 10, kept coming before me this afternoon. The words are these, take away the battlements. For they are not the Lord. The Lord is speaking. And the Lord says, Take the battlements away. They are not of my Joseph. They are not in my plan, nor in my purpose. I want you to take them away. Now that was an exceedingly bitter cry to be heard in the ears of Judah. Jerusalem was God's beloved city. He had sustained her for many a weary year. Oh, he had done that. Those battlements were the city's pride, broad-based, firm set. They could defy assault and laugh at the enemy. And now, lifted through the city streets comes this harsh, the utter cry, take away our battle. 
Now I believe that this sounded like a very cruel cry. A very cruel cry. Judah had been staying herself on securities that had no sanction, sanction in the will and purpose of heaven. And God had commanded that they be taken away, not in hatred, but in mercy. That Judah might be brought back to lean again on the everlasting arm. Oh, there was a purpose for it. There was a plan for it. And God commanded. This is a very cruel cry, you see, that goes ringing down the ages. And I believe it rings clear in our land today. Is it not true that we have built battlements around the word of God, that heaven will not acknowledge? Have you not heard young people and older people too saying, is the Bible an inspired book? Now where can I go for an answer to that question? I certainly would say, first of all, not, not to modern scholarship. Professor Bowman of Glasgow University addressing his students recently said this. The judge today has two great foes, intellectualism and moralism. And he referred to intellectualism and moralism as two great foes. I'm sure he was thinking of the modernist, I'm sure he was, but I would proclaim this truth, that saved man is God's battleground. Give me the witness, by lip and life of a holy man. And I learn that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses from all sin. You may have read the statement made by Swedenborg, the atheist, when he spoke of Jesus as a pale Galilean. A pale Galilean. It seems to me that God is coming to you and he's coming to me tonight. And he's saying, Show me a sinner saved by sovereign grace through Jesus. And I'll declare that he's no pale Galilean. Your thoughts not go back to pre-reformation days? Just for a moment, think of that period. Outside her boundaries, there was no salvation. No sinner could find peace but at her altars. I refer to the Roman Catholic Church. <coughs> then across Europe came this cry, take away her battlements, they are not the Lord's. So Luther, in effect, is saying, so fight I. And her battlements were taken away. Her walls were ruined, her defenses shattered, her glory humbled. But from her ruins there arose the bride of Christ, a free church. Free because men arose to challenge the powers of darkness. 
I wonder, are we prepared to take that stand? And take our place beneath the banner of the cross and challenge the powers of darkness. Oh, I tell you, young folk, the powers of darkness are loose today. I believe, as I already said, that there's a power let loose in the world today that is out to defy every known Christian principle. You're going to face it. You're going to be up against it. But with Paul and with Luther, I find. I can do no other, was that not what Luther said? <coughs> and that must be your stand. Oh, think of the battlements that Paul built around himself. A Hebrew of the Hebrews touching the law of Pharisee concerning seal, persecuting the righteousness which is in the church. What battlements? But there came a day when that apostle could say, No, not of works of righteousness which I have done, but according to his mercy he saved me by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. What confidence, what assurance. Is it not true that we have compromised to such an extent that we do not regard our carnal weapons as carnal. Oh, for the spirit of discernment, I count all things but loss for the excellency of this knowledge. Of Christ Jesus my Lord. Oh, face the enemy with him in you and with you. I believe that saved man is God's battle. Give me the witness of that brother, that sister. And I learned, oh, thank God, I learned that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses. This, of course, is a cry of every reformation. It's a witness of every revival. How well I remember the night of the big move in Barabbas and the over the moon. There was one man is lying outside the church. He's a man somehow. <coughs> And he keeps saying, this is Jesus. Just you think, this is Jesus. He meant that he had discovered that Jesus, who could set him free, he was a very staunch Calvinist. I want to know him afterwards. As a matter of fact, he's an elder in the church today. I remember the night when the realization of Jesus took convention and everything else away from him. In the glorious realization that he had met with Jesus. There comes to my mind something else that happened shortly after that. I was asked to address some meetings in a schoolhouse about six or seven miles away from the church in which I was laboring. And uh, we went there. And uh, as was common at that time, the place was crowded. Oh, it was crowded. And while standing in the pulpit, giving my message, a man came in, walked up the aisle, stood in the middle of it, and said this. He's referring to an elder standing near the door. He said, 
John, let me out of here. If I stay a minute longer, I'll be saved, and I don't want to be saved. Just you think of that. Oh, the mercy of God. I'll be saved, and I don't want to be saved. He walked out. And was making his way across a peat bog on his way back to his home. And God in mercy saved him. While he did not get saved in a meeting, he got saved in a peat bar. God. Oh, that's God. That man is today an elder in the church of that parish. So Fight I. But you will notice that Paul discovered an enemy within himself. Now this is of interest and this is a truth that we want to bear in mind. That there is an enemy in the garrison of my soul. That, that is ever to frustrate the purposes of God. You'll never, You'll never get to the place where it will be impossible for you to sin. Oh, I know. Oh, I know that there are those who preach sinless, who preach sinless perfection. I could never do that. I could never do that. But I but proclaimed, I proclaimed and I thank God for the privilege of proclaiming it that there is such a truth as conditional perfection, which is different. Not sinless perfection, but conditional perfection. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, that's it. That's the condition. And uh, Paul discovered that. And he could say this, I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. I bring it into subjection. He discovered that he had something to do. That there was a place for him to labor consistently in. And I must keep under my body. I must ever be in a place where I can say, get thee behind me, Satan. It's a remarkable thing. I've made this discovery. And sometimes, in my most sacred moments, when on my knees before God, a thought comes into my mind. Could I say a devilish thought? A devilish thought. I remember way back in 21 during the middle guy revival a young farmer <coughs> gloriously saved oh gloriously saved but one morning somebody came to the barn and told them that a cow had broken loose and was among the straw of course, you know what a cow does when he gets in among the straw. There are farmers here, I'm sure. You know all about it. So, of course, he had to get out. It's a wet, wet morning. And had to get in among the straw with his cow, uh, with his horse, rather, to get the cow out of the straw. But the more he sent the dog after the cow, the more the cow ran into the field in among the straw. And then, tragedy. He swore at the old cow. Swore at him. Oh, the devil was near to him. And the devil was there just waiting his opportunity. And that 
dear young fellow, got into fearful bondage. He couldn't believe that he was ever saved. Couldn't believe that he was ever saved. To think he a Christian should sway at the crowd. Now it happened that I was back in that community some little time after that, and they told me that dear Neil Cameron was in an awful state. After the brightness of his profession, now saying that he could never have been saved. So, of course, I felt it was my place just to have a wee, wee word with him. And uh, I did that. Found him in this state. And then uh, I said to him, I didn't realize, Neil, that you had no faith in the devil. I didn't realize at all that you had no faith in the devil. The devil was just beside you when you were running after that cow. And the devil was near at hand when he got that swear word into your mind. And it was the devil who got you tricked up to swear as you did. I'm so thankful that that young man saw that there was a garrison in his soul where the enemy could lurch and wait his opportunity. I mentioned a few nights ago about the young soldier at Free Will Fortress, remaining in hidden caves, waiting their opportunity. And when the opportunity came, out they came and opened the gates, and man's soul fell. You will never be in a place where it will be impossible for you to sin. You will never be in a place where you will be, where you can be absolutely emancipated from the powers of hell. Jesus knew that. Suffered in all points like as we are. I'm thankful to God that that verse is in Scripture. Yet, without sin, and he is able to succor those that are tempted. Oh, here you have it. Paul recognized that he had a part of play. And he said, I keep under my body. I think it was Gurnall, the Puritan, the English Puritan, who said this. All have a desire to be happy. All have a desire to be holy. But few have courage to grapple with the difficulty that meets them on their way to holiness. Grapple with the difficulty. I keep under my body the blood of Jesus Christ God's Son cleanses it from all sin. Perfection, but conditional perfection. And I've got the part to play in it. And I would say this, young folk, that unless you're prepared to pay that part, you're not fit to go out <coughs> to Egypt, to um, Israel. I say that. I may never have the opportunity again to address youth with an issue. But I feel in my soul that I've got to be faithful and declare the whole counsel of God. 
Oh, I'm sure that you thank God for having called you. I'm sure of that. I'm sure you recognize the privilege, a privilege denied to thousands. I say to thousands. And it's yours. It's yours. Oh, brother, sister, see to it that you make the best of it. Don't dishonor God. Don't dishonor your leaders. Oh, don't dishonor the Savior who called you. There's a verse that comes before me just now that speaks of the type of man that I've been referring to, the, 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 the fighter, the man who puts God first. Not just come to Jesus and be happy. No, no. That is a part of it, but it's not the whole part. Honor the glory of God. This is what this man of God said. Give me men to match my mountains. Give me men to match my plains. Men with empires in their vision. Men with eras in their brains. Give me faith and vision. Like Elijah on his knees. Who in hour of death like stillness. Waits to catch the heavenly breeze. Give me men of faith and courage, stripped of every earthly gain, till across our parched valleys, dark, dark will roll God's clouds of rain. And your saint tonight, oh, make me one of these. Oh, give me men to match my mountains. I'll be in the midst of them shortly. Give me men to match my plays, and I'll be there shortly. Men with empires in their vision. Men with eras in their brains. <coughs> Give me men of faith and vision, like Elijah on his knee. Mount Carmen, you'll be thinking of it. You'll be there before it. Who in hours of death like stillness waits to catch the heavenly breeze? The fire, the fire. The fire of God fell. Oh, wouldn't it be wonderful? Wouldn't it be wonderful if just there you saw this happening? My dear brother, why should it not happen? If you're a man of this caliber, stripped of every earthly gain, oh, that's it. Stripped of everything that wasn't in Christ. Now that's just where we stand. That's God's standard for you this evening. God's standard. Across our parched valleys, dark will roll God's cloud of rain. I think I... I hope I'm not keeping you too long. Yes, they haven't kept me right up there at any rate. I don't know if they were showing the figure or not. But it's good to be free. I remember I was addressing a conference in Birmingham. It was uh, a convention. And uh, 
It was a good, good convention. The Spirit of God was in the midst. And uh, the chairman, knowing, knowing a little about me, he took out his watch. And he put his watch in front of me. And that, Lassie, and I sometimes speak about Billy Morrison, she was sitting down just beneath the pulpit. And she spoke out for all to hear. You can put your watch back. He doesn't look at it at any rate. <laughs> watch back. Well, he doesn't look at it. <laughs> but I'm thinking just now of something that happened just, uh, well, two years ago, almost two years, in uh, a certain parish in Lewis. You see, God is moving again, God is reviving again for that remarkable island. And I'm sitting uh, beside the minister and his wife, who were just drinking a cup of tea a day or two before the communion began. And I happened to quote that verse that I put it. Give me men to match my mountain. Give me men to match my play. Men of vision. Stripped of every earthly gain. I went through it all. And that young man turned to his wife and said, let us get on our knees. Didn't turn to me, just to his wife. Let's get on our knees. And on their knees, both he and his wife came to know the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Now, don't misunderstand me, they didn't speak in tongues. Nor have I spoken in tongues. But I believe in every gift mentioned in the Word of God. I believe in every one of them. But, uh, Speaking in tongues, oh, let me say again, it's not the evidence. No one should ever believe that just speaking in tongues is the evidence of baptism. And you give me one single verse of scripture that clearly indicates that. But thank God there is a baptism. There is a filling of God, and this young man was filled with the Holy Ghost. Sunday came, the great day of the communion. And uh, the Lord, I believe, led me to speak from that text, Who is this that cometh from Eden, with dyed garments from Bosra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. I just can't take time to tell you all that happened. But I had to stop preaching. Couldn't go on preaching with the distress among the people. After being there for three hours, it was suggested that a prayer meeting could be held immediately after the service. And because there were over three hours in the church, perhaps I would like a breath of fresh air just to go out for a little. And then those anxious to wait upon God in prayer to come back. And within a quarter of an hour, the church is groaning to capacity. Every available corner crowded with the people. And that meeting continued till five o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. Now that, that wasn't the, the 49 revival. That was God working just now. Working just now. And it comes to me again and again. Why could it not happen with the atmosphere that we had here this morning? My dear people, do you believe that? A heavenly atmosphere.
atmosphere is a revival atmosphere. Miracle could happen. And I would say that miracle was happening. My dear people, I believe miracle happened today. Believe that. Stripped of every earthly gain. That's it. Oh, that's it. Bearing about in my body the dying of Jesus. That the life also of Jesus might be made manifest through my mortal flesh. So, if I die, my last word would you be, keep on fighting. Keep on fighting. But see that you're fighting in the love of Jesus.